thank you, thank you, and thank you again uh, for tuning in, zooming in uh, for our second youth um, discussion. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for zooming in. Um, it's, you, you could have been using your time for something better, but uh, it is my prayer that even as you zoomed in, uh, the grace of God will be with you, and God is going to lift someone up today. And I believe by the end of this discussion, we will have a testimony. Amen. If we can start with the word of prayer. Father, we thank and bless your name for the opportunity that you've given us to come and sit under your feet. Lord God, we ask you one more time to come and take your seat, your rightful place amongst us. Be the head of this discussion. Grant us grace and mercy. Prepare our hearts in the name of Jesus. That those of us who are confused and don't know what to do when it comes to building wealth. Holy Spirit, speak through your panelists today. Speak through your children who are dialing today. And we can learn from each other. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we bless you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Anyway, like I said, thank you so much again. Um, one thing everybody has to know is this. This is Agape Life Ministries, the youth uh, department, and it's, you know, series of talks that we'll be having. This is our second one. And um, tonight, we are blessed. I'm telling you, if I say we are blessed, we are really blessed with, with some young people who, you know, if I don't feel comfortable around somebody, I don't bring them on. You know that. <laughs> you know, so these ones that are here today, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, first, let, 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 me, let me introduce our senior pastor. Reverend Dr. George Adelminta, who has given us this platform that as a youth group, we are able to, you know, meet, talk, and, you know, discuss and have discussions to edify each other. Uh, we thank him for his life. We thank him for all that he's doing. We want to also say hello to our first lady, Mama Julia. I hope She's going to zoom in today uh, for all that you're doing for us. We ask God's blessings upon your life. So tonight, um, I nearly forgot to introduce myself. My name is Pastor Ernest Dodu, a youth pastor of Agape Life Ministries, and um, I'm the host for this program today. Um, today, we are about to talk about how to build wealth, mm -hmm. specifically for millennials, you know, specifically for millennials. And um, it's, it's important that we understand who we are in Christ, that we are not borrowers. We should be the lenders. And let me put this thing right here. Sorry. Yes. Yes, we are not borrowers and we should be the lenders. And all things belong to us. But it looks like some of us, we don't realize what we have in Christ. And we let it go by. But tonight, it is my prayer that by the, by the time we finish this discussion, you have a better understanding of finances and how to build wealth. Remember, uh, this program is based on two scriptures, Proverbs 27, Proverbs 22, verse 7, and Proverbs 21, verse 17. Okay? Proverbs 22, verse 7, and Proverbs 21, verse 17. Okay. So, in a form of introduction, The goal here is this, okay? We want young people to
to know how to set priorities. If you're going to be rich, it has to start somewhere. You have to go get a job. You can't sit in your mom or your dad's basement thinking that you'd be a wealthy man or a wealthy woman. No, it doesn't work like that. So hopefully by the time we finish, you know why it is important to set priorities. And also how young people can set up a budget. You know, when you look at Proverbs 24, 27, it talks about that, how young people can set up a budget. And you look at Luke 14, 28 to 30, also helps you in that area. Also, the idea is to help young people build on emergency fund. And by the time we finish, you understand what an emergency fund is. Remember Joseph and Pharaoh? Joseph told him what is ahead, and therefore they saved towards it. Okay? So, emergency fun it's also very very important and also how young people can avoid debt like i said earlier when you read proverbs 22 7 it will let you understand that you are not going to be a slave to the lender because when you are the borrower like the bible says you are a slave to the lender and i don't think anybody on this platform wants to be there okay so we also go about how to diversify your investment. I'm hoping that our panelists will take it into all these things. And when you have any questions, please don't hesitate to type it in or when it's question time, you ask your questions because they're here to, you know, for us to have a conversation, okay? And finally, how not to be taking too much risk as you keep growing. But you're young now, so you can take risk when it comes to finances, you know? And last but not the least, generally, you are going to leave this conversation knowing how to set up a financial plan, why it is important for you to set up a financial plan. Some of you, when you are going to be shopping in the mall, you, you plan what you're going to do. So. Finances is also very, very important, okay? So we're going to have a good time. So don't let me take too much time. I, want, I don't want to talk too much. I want these young people to be doing all the talking. And tonight, let me introduce you to our panelists. And first on the list is Pastor and Mrs. Eric Gavoa. Pastor and Mrs. Gavoa, if you can wave so we know who you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Pastor Gavua, I think um, he graduated from the University of Ghana. He got his bachelor's and his master's there, and he left Ghana and came over here to High University for second master's. Currently, I think he's um, he works as a senior consultant in an IT firm in somewhere in DC. You know, when people start to say somewhere in D.C., they're either with the CIA or the FBI or the Secret Services. <laughs> so that is Pastor Gavoa and the wife, the lovely wife, Mrs. Olivia Gavoa. She is one of my own. She's a Sunday school teacher, so she is dear to my heart. And it's somebody who is so passionate about prayer, too. So... Don't think it's only Pastor Gavwada is so prayer-minded. The wife is there with him. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Gavwa is a wealth manager, uh, and his, her career is in wealth management. But amazingly, she has a small, she calls it small. <laughs> <laughs> My online business, design business. Mm -hmm. That lady will, man, I'm telling you, she would design, she designed clothes, I mean, furniture, everything. She does everything. And when you get a chance, please look at uh, barrel, barreling designs. Is that correct? It's barreling yeah. designs, right? Yeah. Barreling designs. Yeah. You know, she, she has a first degree from the University of Ghana also. And um, she has a master's from the University of Maryland. And 
both Pastor and Mrs. Gavua help our senior pastor with premarital counseling. So they have a broad net. And a quick story, man. Mr. Gavua, Pastor Gavua was Olivia's TA way back in Ghana. <laughs> When I say TA, most of you understand. I'm an assistant, so you, you can understand the relationship. But I'll leave that for them to bring that up, okay? <laughs> so that is Pastor and Mrs. Gavua. And next, we have, oh my goodness, just smile. You know I'm coming to you. This is Miss Frida Opoku. Frida is, is Frida. Don't let us go there. Let's, let's go on. <laughs> Frida has a background in biochemistry and pharmacology. Frida was on her way to medical school, and she decided to change everything. <laughs> so, guys, when you get a chance, ask her, because we're here to talk. Currently, Frida is a lead senior information security analyst. She's also in IT, and she's a young lady with dreams and aspirations and she's working towards them she she one day wants to own her own it firm and i think she's working on that so ladies and gentlemen this is my frida she's single <laughs> for you guys that are out there this pretty lady is single so just note that amen yeah. that is frida opoku Last but not the least, my own nephew. Uh, this young man, when, when you talk about loving God, this is the man you want to talk to. His name is Kwabra Ejaku Boateng. Yep, yep, yep. Kwabra is also an IT guy. I know he works somewhere in DC. But these days, even when you are calling, you can't get him. <laughs> but he's in IT. I really, they, these people, they don't tell you what they do. Uh, they, they work with the president or who, I don't, I don't know. But all I know is the man is always busy. He's always busy. He is called Mr. Cool back in our <laughs> church. Everybody calls him Mr. Cool. The man has so many nicknames. For those of you in London, you have different nicknames for him. But he just released his single, and the man loves music. But his music, he wants to be rich in music, not money-wise. But his music is dedicated to winning souls for God. So that is where he counts his profit. Okay? His single just came out. I will follow you, and find myself singing this song even in my dreams, man. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, my son, Kwabana Ejaku Bwati. All right, all right. Kwabana, you didn't even wait for them to see you. Hello. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's, get, let's get things started, man. We're going straight to the point. Um, and, and my first question will go to Pastor and Mrs. Gavua. Why do you think why do you think God is so concerned about our finances and especially for millennials? Why is God concerned about finances when it comes to, especially when it comes to millennials? Thank you, Pastor Dudu, and um, thanks for having us. Um, I think God would definitely be interested in our finances because um, first of all, and God created man to exercise dominion over the earth. And if you go to Genesis 1 verse 20, it, says, it is explicitly spelled out there. And this is not God alone speaking, but it is the Godhead speaking, the three in one, the Trinity speaking. And they are saying, let us create man in our own image. And not only in our own image and likeness, but then let us give them power and authority to exercise dominion over the earth and the creatures of the earth. Uh, so you can see that God is interested in us dominating the earth, not in a negative way like it's going around these days and um, dominating, dominating, but to exercise control over the earth as his children. And uh, one thing I want to point out is that um, dominion does not come in a vacuum. It's not exercised in a vacuum. You definitely need something to exercise dominion. 
And that one thing that I think we need to exercise dominion is money. I mean, there is no two ways about that. Um, there's no way around it at all. Money is power. Money controls everything. In Ecclesiastes 6, 10, verse 19, it says that money answered everything. And uh, even the verse that you are using, that's Proverbs 22, verse 7, it says the, rule will, what, the rich will rule over the poor. Yeah. We're interested in our finances to the extent that if we have finances, then we'll be able to answer all things and we'll be able to influence decisions. I mean, when you go to Washington now, um, the politicians, they, they are the beck and call of these super PACs. Super PACs and this National Rifle Association, these lobbies, they have the money, they control them, so they influence decisions. Mm. God knows that if he puts money in our hands or if we manage our finances well, then we'll also be in that position to influence decisions and uh, bring a change and impact the society. So I think to that extent, God is interested in our finances. And uh, coming back to the youth, um, definitely the youth, I believe, are leaders in waiting. Um, tomorrow belongs to them. They are the future. Covenant sitting here is the future. Definitely, he's the future. And therefore, God will definitely be interested in his finances because he knows that in a few years to come, there's going to be that generational order change. They're going to take charge. And uh, right. they have to, right. they have to organize their finances right from today. Then they'll be better than those there today. They'll be able to impact. They'll be able to influence. They'll be able to make decisions with money. Because if you you have their voice. And so I believe to that extent, God is interested in the youth. I was even looking out for some of the millennials who are millionaires, and uh, I came to yeah. find Kylie Jenner. She, yes. And she's a millionaire. Well, yes. But if you think Kobina, for instance, who well, has, I, claim, I claim that for all who are zooming right now. That, exactly. And the youth, if they have their passion, yeah. I, yeah. they have money, then millionaires by now, then they'll be doing a lot of back to you concerts <laughs> and yeah. doing just Hollywood concerts and stuff like that. So to that extent, I think God is interested in the youth having money, especially yeah. Christian youth. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. I really appreciate you saying that. But ladies and gentlemen, I forgot to tell you that uh, Pastor and Mrs. Gabo have two children, Erica and my boy Jojo. So just to let you know, before Jojo attacks me, <laughs> and I see, I see our young people have tuned in from out of the country. We have a few that, on behalf of our senior pastor, Reverend George Ademit, I just want to say kudos to our millennials who are in the services, the Navy. Uh, we have um, Sam, who is in the Navy in Tokyo right now. We have Leslie. Also in the Navy, he's in California right now, getting ready to ship up. And we have Lou in the Air Force in Italy. And when we have Osbert, Osbert is in the Navy, he's in Illinois right now. So we just want to say thank you for keeping us safe, fighting for this country and keeping this country safe and all that you do, okay? Okay, so now let, let's go on. Um, now that we've established the fact that God is interested in our finances, Frida, what's your story, man? Just, just tell us your story. What is your story? My story as it pertains to my financial journey? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, I mean, as we all know, you know, being African, um, sometimes we feel like to be wealthy or to have a certain type of wealth, you need to be a certain type of age. You know, I mean, growing up, we have that mentality um, from the household, I guess, that some of us grew up in. And me moving to the U.S., you know, having my education and going through school, um, undergrad, not having student loans, and then pursuing my master's degree and ending up having student loans, it just hit me one time. I realized that I was really struggling. And I realized, I was like, you know, I'm going through all these hardships. And yet, I'm also actually digging more holes for myself with the student loans. And I wanted to get out. I wanted to be at a place where I'm liberated. I'm free. You know, um, like the scripture says, you know, the borrower is a slave to the lender. I didn't want to be a slave. I wanted to live a life where... Not only am I fulfilled, but I have that freedom to know that I can pursue other dreams mm. that I have in mind. 
So with me um, starting off, um, I guess once I had that epiphany, I wanted to change my financial life. And that came about with me, of course, doing research, you know, talking to people. Um, there was a moment that I set up an appointment to talk to Pastor George um, about my career goals. You know, he connected me with a couple of people regarding the medical field. And also we talked about my finances and my interest in IT. So just seeking that guidance and having somebody to really talk to me about finances. And to be quite honest, I feel like that was the very first time that I really got to understand like finances where Pastor was able to break down a few things to me in terms of making sure I tackle my loans and saving and different types of, you know, um, investments out there or different types of saving uh, methodologies. And of course, when I took that information, I just, I just didn't sit on it. I went back home, I did more research. And at that point, I was like, I need to turn my financial life around. And okay. what do I need to do? And that came about with me actually writing things down, what I really needed to do, what I, did, what I really wanted for my life. So I wrote things down in terms of how I want to tackle everything. Of course, I wanted to get rid of my student loans because that was one of the biggest things that I was facing at the time. Yeah. Right? I wasn't really making a lot of money. But yet I had all these loans, like basically yes. continuously pushing me down. So to get rid of my student loans, that came so can you me. can you hold that? Because sure. there are there are trust me, almost everybody here has a problem with students' loans. So I want you to hold the thought down because you, when it comes to that, you're the guru. <laughs> so we're going to come back to you. Okay. Sure. All right. So, yeah, I just made a lot of lifestyle changes, you know, and um, through that, of course, um, and like, I guess we'll come back to the student most aspect. I made a lot of life, life, lifestyle changes, you know, um, not only that, side gigs, you know, side hustles, trying to find ways to make money passively, you know, and a whole lot of different things that I believe we will get into um, as okay as the discussion goes on. So I'll be able to give more details as we go through the layers of it. Uh, I know you, I know you, I know you will do that. <laughs> Definitely. So um, I guess it basically boils down to coming to that realization of what you want for your life. You know, what do you really want out of your life? And for me, I just wanted a life where I wouldn't be working like hard to live when I'm 60 or 70. You know, I needed to change my life now so I can reap the benefits later on in life. Okay. And I think having, to, having come to that realization, of course, set the pace for everything else that I did afterwards. Okay. All right. We'll come, we'll come, I'll come back to you. Mr. Ku. Yes, Uncle. <laughs> everything okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So just to let uh, everybody know, in, in our church, uh, especially with the youth department, one thing that, Anytime we realize the other point, and personally, some a few of them have told me I'm putting pressure on them. But then Pastor says that just like Frida said, we tell them, look, milk your parents as much as you can, stay in their homes as much as you can. But when you leave your home, don't check in into an apartment, check in into your own place. Okay, so we encourage them to do that. Mr. Koo. You are a typical example, and um, if you can tell us your story, at the age of 26, you bought your first house, right? Yes. Okay, so go ahead. Tell us your story, man. Um, I think for me, uh, the, best, the best thing that happened to me was being under uh, Pastor Reverend Dr. Georgia Deminter. So, cause, because who, is, who, is, who is Dr. Reverend Dr. Georgia Deminter to you? <laughs> He's my uncle. <laughs> okay, you didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, being under his wings, he taught me a lot of things that um, I, d I didn't know and I, I had never experienced. So um, he guided me on the things that I'm supposed to do in terms of my finances. And some of the things that he always said to me was that anytime you get paid, make sure you pay God first and make sure you pay yourself second, treat yourself as you're paying a bill. So me taking that into consideration, that helped me a lot. So I was able to save because I was in his house, I wasn't paying for rent or anything. So I was able to save a lot. So he told me that um, 
this is the best thing to do if you are moving if you want to be on your own the best thing to do is to get your own house because sometimes people make it seem like you have to do a huge sum of um, down payment to get a house yeah. i can just put something small there and get your own place and you even pay less than you pay you even pay less than paying a rent so when he told when he when he said that to me that really sunk in so i was working towards that i was doing my research and, and he guided me in every step of my journey so that's 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 my story in terms of um getting my own place it was, it was okay. past all right okay so um yeah so guys right now we all realize that our panelists have given us their introduction and everything uh Pastor and uh, Mrs. Gavua, I'm coming back to you. We have a lot, a, a lot of young people who are on this Zoom platform right now. Okay, some may have just completed college. Some may have completed maybe a few years ago. They're working. They have money. They have money coming in, but you know priorities have not been set right. Okay, and like I said, from um, Luke 14, 28, when you are building a tower, you make plans. Because the Bible says if you don't, then people, you'll not be able to complete it, and people will look at it and they will laugh at you. What would you tell, how would you guide young people, somebody who is just coming out of school, they, they are making money, they're just putting their money in a savings account. I had to lash out on one of my nieces, a few months ago, you know, what, what would be your advice to them coming out of school? How, how, how did they start the process of building wealth? So, um, you know, you are fresh out of college, you're working, you have a lot of disposable income because you don't have a lot of financial obligations. Um, I would say, first of all, you have to set financial goals for yourself, you know, um, setting financial goals for yourself kind of guides you towards the, the kind of future that you want to have financially. Setting financial goals means um, setting up an emergency fund. Um, if you want to have a life insurance, well, you can have... Oh, can you... Can, yeah, so a, lot of, a lot of them don't understand what an emergency fund is. Can you explain okay. that a little bit? Okay. So emergency fund um, basically is having money set aside for um, emergencies. Like you never know at a time, maybe you may lose your job. You know, there are so many uncertainties in life. So it will mean that um, you, you never know where there'll be a time where you would go through loss of a job. An emergency fund for me they usually say you should have about six months worth of, let's say, your mortgage or rent saved for, you know, emergency. And um, I believe that you all know that sometimes it takes about three to, you never know, two to three months or so to find a new job. So having a, an emergency fund will kind of, you know, cover you during the times where, you know, there's a loss of job or, um, you know, something something for a car repair or something you never just know. like just like the COVID situation exactly there so many people went through times where they didn't have jobs yeah. and you have that emergency fund which is saving set aside for times where uh, unpredictable times where you would need money to fund you know your rent pay your car notes um pay your insurance bill pay your student loan Emergency funds come in very handy. So it's very important to have that. And then secondly, um, it is very important to take care of your debt. As you all know, being uh, debt free is, is a tone for having, being financially free, you know, having financial freedom. So it's very important to take care of your debt after school, if you have student loans that needs to be taken care of, you can, you know, start paying on those. Um, you also have to try as much as possible not to take in too many, you know, credit card bills. And then and I, I would also advise that if you have a lot of disposable income, you can, you know, talk to 
your financial advisors at your bank. You can put money into CDs, which mm. are called certificate of deposits. Yeah. You just leave your money in regular um, savings accounts. Yeah, like, yeah. See, my baby girl was doing that. She, she, yeah. I didn't know that when she came to tell me. So we had a fight here, you know. Yeah. And now she bought CDs and she now she when she's walking, she's smiling. I said, just ah. smiling from CD. Just mm -hmm. imagine what you're going to be doing when you see things going up and up and up. Go ahead. Right. So you can, you know, get a CD. You can also start contributing towards your your retirement, your IRA. And mm -hmm. you, you know that when you put money in your 401k, most companies match it up. So if you are young, you don't have kids, you don't have a lot of financial obligations. You can, you know, contribute more, maybe 10%, 5% or whatever, and your, your, your employer will match it up. Those funds are, they are not tax deductible. I mean, sorry, they are not taxed. So it's actually, you know, building wealth for you. Okay. And you can also, you know, look into mutual funds. You know, you can use some of your money to buy mutual funds. You can also actually buy a house like Kwabena talked about. Don't be afraid to own a home at a very young age. Even if you are single, you can buy a house maybe to uh, rent. You get rental um, income. And then also remember that a home builds equity for you, you know? So it's all building wealth. If you don't want to live uh, alone in a home, you can even have a, um, somebody rent and live with you. And that's also rental income. So there are so many ways which you can use your money for first, take, off, take care of your debt, make sure you are not accruing so many you know, credit card bills, set up aside emergency funds, you can use some of your money to, um, you know, invest in CD certificates of deposits. Also make sure that you are putting money into your retirement, which your employer matches up. Okay. And, and you can also buy a home like Kwabena oh. Equity. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back to you. I see your, your husband is shaking his head in agreement <laughs> to all that you're saying. Yeah. So, um, Frida, coming back to you, um, personally, I believe anticipation is power when it comes to finances, okay? And just to let people know, you are getting ready to buy your first house. You just haven't found what you want. Money saved and everything. You're just ready to go. Actually, I'm in the process, just haven't closed that yet. Oh, girl. <laughs> okay. All right. Congratulations. Thanks. Anyway, so now your thing, when you came out of school, you were faced with student loans. Okay, so your brothers and sisters are on the line right now. Just mm -hmm. talk to them, what you did, how you were able to come out of that. Awesome. So, yeah, um, so I, I'll take it from two sides. So first, those of us who live with our parents, I think this is a very great opportunity to really tackle this um, debt. Because as we, as our main scripture says, you know, the borrower is a slave to the lender. And I think the advantage is when you live with your parents or relatives where you don't have, you know, much responsibilities with rent or maybe perhaps car notes or other bills, this is a great opportunity to really get rid of the student loans. And what I mean by that is, you know, um, setting the goal, like um, Sister Olivia said, to aggressively tackle it. For instance, if the student loan, you need to pay maybe a thousand a month on it, and you can go up to 1500, do it. Because what that, what that is, when you do that, when you get out of that, you will have so much opportunity. I mean, think of it this way. Now you are tackling this issue now, but you have to think of the long-term effect. The long-term effect is if you're able to get rid of this loan, in the future, every money that you make is coming to you 100%. You don't have that extra loan, which may accrue more interest, you know, on it to tackle. So it's a really great opportunity for you to really go ahead and tackle that as much, just max it out as much as you can, especially if you're living with parents. Don't rush to go rent a house, I mean, to rent an apartment. Don't rush to move out. This is a great opportunity to tackle that. Um, now, the other side of it is like somebody like me who had no, you know, family support. And of course, I had to 
have a place to stay and have all these other responsibilities. But then I also have this loan that I wanted to get rid of. I had to make a lot of sacrifices and it's uncomfortable, you know, like you may see that shoe, that dress that you really, really want, but is it really a necessity? And for me, I had to think of, like I said, the long-term goal. Can I have that instant gratification now of getting the things that I want now and, you know, be in debt and continue to struggle for a long period of time or cut down on certain things that I need, make these sacrifices now and enjoy or reap the benefits later, you know? So um, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable, but you have to really want it. You have to set your mind to it and you have to be very disciplined to say, this is what I want and look at the long-term benefit of that. Because the thing with student loans is it's very easy to defer some of these loans. It's very easy to ignore, but it's still your responsibility. Whether it takes 20 years, 50 years, 10 years, three months or whatever, you still have to pay. And it's still yeah. accruing interest. Nobody cares if you don't want to pay today or tomorrow. The interest is still building up. And the more money there is, the more the interest, yeah. you know? So um, in the long run, you are actually going to end up hurting yourself than to tackle and now go through that uncomfortable state, making sacrifices, basically um, looking at your spending, you know. And for me, one thing that has really helped me is I have a budget. Like I literally went online. I looked at some sample budgets, created my own spreadsheet that works for me. There's so many apps out there that can help you to budget. And I created a budget. And I had to cut down on things that I don't need. Like for me, I don't have cable. I only need internet. You know, there's something like Fire Stick, Hulu. Instead of getting a cable that is going to cost you maybe $130 a month, there are um, Hulu Plus, that is $11 a month. You know, I don't watch TV a lot, so do I really need cable? So that just basically having that budget and cutting down on things that we don't need because if you really look at it, at times we spend so much money on things that we really don't need. And mm. that has really helped me a lot to really tackle my student loans. And I paid it. Basically, I'm basically done and I'm so grateful. But it was an uncomfortable process. And I feel like now I'm good because looking back, I know that by next year, every money that I make is going to come to me. Yeah. Every money I make is going to come to me. And now I'm going to be able to even do more than I'm doing now. And not only that, I'm like that peace of mind, that financial freedom that you have knowing that you don't have this debt sitting on you. And regardless of the amount of loan, it can be tackled. For me, my student loans, I didn't even think that I would be able to pay it like up as much as I did because at the time it was a monster to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And then once I started tackling it, I was like, wow, this is really doable because um, society has made us think that student loan is this monster that is like, Oh, you know, you're going to pay for the rest of your life. That is not true. That is a complete lie. You can pay off your student loan, whether it's 100000 200 whatever the amount is. It takes discipline. It takes sacrifices. It takes commitment. You need to budget. You need to cut down things that you don't need. There's so many things that as people who spend money on um, that we don't need, especially um, for a youngster who just graduated from school and is living with parents and don't have responsibility. It's very easy to squander your money on things that you don't need. Yeah. Because you don't have that responsibility. You know, you have so much money at your disposal and you can easily want that new shoe, that new Jordan, that new whatever. But is it really a necessity? And you know, you may think, oh, I'm losing out on a whole lot of things now, but it's an instant gratification. These are things that are gonna depreciate anyways. You know, there's gonna be a time that you may need the new item. And you making the sacrifice now, in the long run, you'll be able to afford anything you want and not even worry about whether, you know, I really need this or not. So I think um, it takes a lot of sacrifice and it will be worth it. It will be worth it. It takes discipline and, you know, making sure you are tackling it aggressively. Of course, um, for somebody like me who had other responsibilities, um, I had to pay my rent. I had to, you know, do a whole lot of stuff. And just to kind of go back on Cabernet's point, that's one thing that I know when I spoke with Pastor, it, it really helped me a lot. Like the paying yourself, that was the first time I heard it. Mm. Of course, you pay your rent and then you pay yourself because I was in that hole where I was like, okay, I have all these bills. Let me take care of it. But to know that even if it's $50 that I'm paying myself, it makes me feel good because then I don't feel too bad that oh, the, all the money I'm making, I'm just using it to pay bills, right? I take out my, my tithe 
I pay myself and I take care of whatever bill I need to pay. Mm. You know, and of course, sometimes I may not even pay myself sometimes. And that's yeah. one of the sacrifices that I had to make, you know. Okay. Sometimes I'm like, you know what, instead of paying myself, let me add that to that extra amount that I need to pay towards my student loans. Because I really don't need that extra um, shoe or that extra cloth or whatever the case may be. So, um, I guess. Okay, <laughs> just, just that I yeah, 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 you know, um, we'll come back to you. Uh, Mr. Kwabra. Yes, uncle. Kwabra, you're chilling, no? <laughs> <laughs> Look, guys, Kwabra, I didn't tell you, but Kwabra is also in a relationship, serious, serious relationship. So he's not available. Frida is available, but Kwabra is not available. So, so Kwabra, um, <laughs> let me ask you this, man. I know when you when you live with uh, Pastor George, I mean, whether you like it or not, you come out with wisdom oozing out of every part of your body, man. <laughs> but my thing is, did you take family into consideration? When I say family, I mean your family, you, your wife and children into consideration in your financial planning. And how, how did that influence you to get to where you are right now? Yes, I, I really considered it because um, for me, my role model, or let me say, someone who I, I aspire to be like one day is Pastor George. And looking at him and his family, his um, lovely wife and his children, how they started everything together, it really inspired me. So I was like, you know what? If I have everything in place, um, by the time I get married, things will be smooth for me because um, when they came, they laid out the foundation for us. And they didn't even have the opportunities that we have now. So uh, listening to him, listening to a story, I was like, you know what? I have an advantage right now because um, the, the sacrifices they made now, the, the sacrifices they made back then, I'm now reaping it because they laid the foundation for us. They gave us the right information and everything. So before, um, my, before the family comes into the scene, I want everything to be straight before... Um, I want everything to be straight before things get awkward because you don't want a situation whereby um, you are married and you are struggling financial wise. You can't take care of your kids, or maybe they are lacking, or it's, it's just an uncomfortable feeling. Mm. Or even even you right now, as human as human, I was a kid and I wanted something for my mom and she couldn't afford it for me, or she couldn't give me the necessary education or the necessary um, the necessary things I needed as a kid. I was, I'm going to feel I'm going to feel very uncomfortable. So I just wanted to make sure that everything was stable for me. And by the time um, my family comes in, I'll be great. So that really influenced the way I think. Um, and because of that, I was putting things into place financial-wise. So that's the, it really inspired me in terms of me putting things in place financial-wise. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, uh, uh, Pastor, Pastor Eric, um, Eric, I'm coming back to you guys. You know, back home... Um, when I say back home, it's like some ways back, you know. Mm -hmm. When um, our older sisters get to the age where they have to be getting married, one thing I realize is they've been buying like huge pots of pants and, you know, empty suitcases. And I mean, <laughs> I believe those times are past, you know. But for this generation, what would be your advice to a young, young person who wants to be financially stable, like Kwabra is saying? What kind of steps do you think they need to take to make sure they are financially stable? And then when they, when, when, when they get married and they are moving into their own place, it's not like from honeymoon, then they are going to live in some, some, some man's house that is collecting rent from them. Yeah. What would be your guideline for them? Uh, thank you very much, um, Pastor Ernest. Oh, I, before you go on, uh, I just want to let our audience know that I don't give them a question ahead of time. So every question you are hearing me ask them is on just right now. They have to think and answer. I don't want people to come sit down and do chew and pour like robots. So. This is just a discussion. That is why I don't give them questions ahead of time. So 
Pastor Eric, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. I think I'll be addressing men first, um, young, um, young guys first, because of my background as a man. So most of the things I'll say will pertain to men, and then we can chip in women too, though. Yeah, but it will be relevant for all of us. You can take a few runs across the board. But for a young man who um, has just completed school, my advice to you would be to be focused and uh, family-oriented. That is who I was. My wife would tell you, um, I got to know my wife when we retired into my father's, when my father retired into his retirement home in Tema. We were friends. We started off as friends. I didn't even know that it would turn out to be a relationship. But in my final year, I got born again. And uh, when I came back home, uh, I don't know, but it just bubbled in my spirit. I believe it is the Holy Spirit that uh, ignited me to get to know that this is my bone of bones and my flesh of flesh. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so there and then, we have been friends all this while. When I was in Cisco, she was in our phone three, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when I got to um, first year, or final year in the university, so that's how long we've been together. And when I got to the final year in the university, I told her that we have to... Uh, step up this thing. We have to move it into a relationship. And yeah. uh, I was very much focused and family oriented. So I knew that I had to take care of a family straight right. Yeah. So, like Kobna was saying, it tied into my plans. And the uh, savings was a big thing. And uh, at that time, I didn't even know what savings was. So I was just putting money aside. But having sat under Pastor George, we know Kobna has already laid out the guidelines that he say pay God first. And secondly, he will tell you that um, set an amount down that you save every month, right? Set it down, I mean, that you pay every month. And uh, so I want gentlemen to know that if you set out that you will be family oriented, it will discipline you, it will make you save because you definitely have to provide for the needs of your family. And then one more thing I want to add is that um, he said that do not save after you have spent, you know, what, what was it? I mean, spend what is left after you have saved. That's one yeah. thing George taught yeah. us. Spend what is left after you have saved. Don't do it the opposite way. Don't spend and then whatever is left, you go and you save. Yeah. <laughs> because the aim is to build wealth, not to get rich. Yeah. So yeah. There's a difference between rich yes, and sir. Yes, sir. A lot of us, say, say that again. Say that yeah, again. There's a difference. People are are making money. They are earning a hundred thousand. They think they are, they are they are wealthy. They are not rich. When you lose that job, that money is gone. Wealth is that you invest the riches into a stable enterprise that will generate some revenue constantly. That is where you can say you are wealthy. So that if the rich saying I have money, you are saying I'm not worrying about money because I have something generating money. Mm -hmm. So that is the mindset for me. But. I, I wanted to at least start and get a, a house even in Ghana before we come here, but dynamics change after, right? And then we had to move here. But secondly, one thing too, I want the young men to know that um, whilst you are focusing on family, you also have to know that, um, I don't know how to put it very well, but depending on the gap between you, if you have a, a, a fiance, don't worry. Whilst you are staying in your father's house, invest in adding value to yourself. I was very fortunate when I was coming out of college. My wife, who is now, who was then my fiancee, was in first year. So I had this three years, three year gap, so to speak, prepare. to prepare. So what I did was that I added value to myself. I checked into graduate school in Ghana. I went to study international affairs, diplomacy, because I had two choices. I wanted to do law or be a diplomat. And it paid off. When I finished, I got two jobs. I got the first job in foreign service, and I got another job in gateway project. But I was following money, so I took the gateway project job. <laughs> I think I should have joined the foreign service. Today, I would have, I would have been a seasoned diplomat. But... So decision-making is very, very important. We need to consult wisely to know what kind of decisions we take uh, in our prime when we, are, when we are young. So it paid off, like I said. And then talking about student loan too, before we came here, once I was working, I cleared all my student loan. Ghana, you go for a loan for your um, uh, first degree. And I cleared all that loan. So I had money. So at least if you are not able to 
buy anything at that point, even to get ready for marriage. Once you have savings, at least, and you're able to buy a house, and you have savings, you know that all other things will fall in place when you get into marriage. So oh. saving is key. Even okay. if then you have big savings, that's very good. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Mrs. Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Uh, Gabwa, I'm coming back. I'm coming to you. Because see, when he was talking, he didn't talk about the thing that bothers ladies. And oh. major, majority of them, you know, they're saying, look, I'm saving for a wedding. They want a flashy wedding. You know, they haven't thought about getting a house. Mm-hmm. They want a flashy wedding for everybody to come and enjoy, go on a honeymoon and then come back and then start thinking of where to live. Now, what is, what is your story when it comes to that? How did you prepare these young men to the stage where you guys are, that you are comfortable? So, um, I remember after college, I traveled to London, you know, to work and then save for our wedding. There is nothing wrong with, you know, planning and saving for your wedding, you know. You, you have to have financial goals, like I said. You always have to have your priorities before getting married. Um, both you and your fiancé can discuss, um, do we want to own a house? What kind of life do we want for our children? Um, do we want to be traveling? Do we want to pay our student loans you know, off very quickly? How much debt do we have? How do we want to clear those things? So for me, we had talked about all those things that I knew that we were going to have a wedding. So I traveled to, you know, save money. But then um, in saving the money, we had a budget. It's very, very important that you have a budget if you want to have a wedding or, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with having an elaborate wedding. If you have the money for it, maybe you can have your family support you with a wedding. Sometimes parents contribute to the, you know, planning and the expenses of a wedding. But I would advise that if you, if you have those financial goals in place, then you know what your priorities are. Are you going to, you know, borrow money to have an elaborate wedding? And then after you are married, you, uh, you know, both you and your spouse are in a financial strain, which can bring stress on the marriage. You don't actually want that. So with us, I came to Ghana, saved money, went to Ghana. But then unfortunately, my dad passed away and I had to travel here. So he joined me here and um, he came to school actually and I was working but I wasn't making a lot of money. We couldn't have a wedding. We had an engagement back home. But when we came here, at the time, we were starting life. We didn't have any family here. We didn't have a lot of, you know, financial resources. So we decided to see our pastor at our former church. We went there and we had a blessing at church. It was a very small ceremony with um, a few friends. So for us, um we looked at um where we were in life we didn't have i wasn't making a lot of money then and he was in school so we always had a principle to cut our quotes according to our size Mm. i advise the young ladies it's very important that you don't try to keep up with the joneses um you have to have your priorities set right do you want to put all your savings into having an elaborate wedding whereby after it will you know bring financial strain to the marriage or do you want to you know save some of the money you know to buy a house um to have a better life for your children so it all boils down to having financial goals um you can have a beautiful wedding there's nothing wrong with that but when you save for that wedding have a budget and also make sure that you save some for the marriage but not only for the wedding so that's okay. why I, yeah, I, I have one more thing to add to the youth i was saying that yes, graduate school but in these times now you don't necessarily have to go to graduate school if you sure school you may want to go if you want to but there are other skills that you can acquire. For my master, for all the two masters and first degree that I have, it is the skill that I learned on the site that I'm giving me money now. Yeah. So 
you can go to um, grad school if you want to, but please, the focus shouldn't be that if you don't go to grad school, add value to yourself. There are technical skills that you can add, technological skills. Now the emphasis is on um, science and what technology. So I mean, what people they can go to radio. There are some courses in radiology, um, some courses in um, what do you call it, um, nuclear medicine. There are a lot of courses that you can do on the side that will equally give you money. It's not only graduate school. So the fact that I said I went to graduate school doesn't mean everybody should go to graduate. School. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, uh, I mean, speaking about that, uh, my my line at University of Science and Technology was land economy estate management. Yeah. But uh, I'm here in radiology. So, yeah. hey, um, say amen to that. Okay, yeah. so guys, uh, <laughs> we're going to open the question lines. Uh, but before we do that, I want to go to Frida. Um, so get your questions ready. Um, Frida, you good? Yeah, I am. <laughs> okay. So uh, I talk to you all the time. I mean, we talk and... Yeah. But people on the line may not know. Um, I know in your planning, mm -hmm. you have your husband, your children, and all those things in consideration. Mm -hmm. What would you talk to young ladies just like you? How to go about getting themselves financially secured when it comes to a typical, you know, strong black woman what would you what would you tell them yeah so just to add on to what everybody said um with so with the savings of course the 401k you know that is an investment that you're making for your future not only for you but the family that you're going to have as well including your children and your husband so i would definitely encourage that if you are working and your employer is offering that definitely take advantage of it Definitely. It's, it's a really great way to, I mean, think of it this way. If you, are, if you have a regular savings account and let's say, assuming you put $100 in it every month and somebody's going to match that for you, why not take advantage of it? You know, so definitely use that. So for me, that is one of the things that I do, of course, with my 401k, you know, um, where I definitely try to match the maximum and I, I actually do it extra that my employer matches. Um, I also have a few investments, um, some like mutual funds, you know, other, other investments that are passively, you know, earning, in, um, money for me. So those are the type of things that I'm doing. Um, of course, like I mentioned earlier, you know, there are some side gigs that I currently have. <laughs> I know it might sound like yeah, this girl really loves money, but I'm just trying to set a pace, not only for myself, but for my children. Because if I get to the place where I'm financially sound, my children, I'll be able to set up college funds for my children, whereby I would not encourage, I mean, knowing what I know about student loans, I'm not going to encourage my children to take student loans because I won't do that. And not only that, I'm going to, you know, um, set up a time for them where of course, they'll be able to have other resources available to them to avoid them to taking loans or even getting themselves in debt. For instance, what I mean by that is, if my kid wants to have some sort of degree and I feel like they can go to a community college to get their credits, you know, whereby they could eventually maybe transition into a four-year, I'm not gonna encourage them to just automatically go to a four-year college. Knowing that they can go to a community college to get, you know, some of these credits, to basically set them ahead of time to not only if they transfer to go take maybe a maximum amount of loan or whatever the case may be. And I feel like I'm kind of diverting a little bit, but I'm making a point. And I feel like that is one of the things that at times we find ourselves in where we create that hole of debt for us. And it affects, of course, like, you know, some of the things that I'm doing for my future family, because we feel like you need to be successful by going to a four year college. That is not true. That is not true at all. And like what um, Pastor um, Gabwa was saying, the degrees that I attain, I'm not even using any of them to work right now. You know, I'm not gonna say they're useless, not at all, because education is very important. But I also feel like there are so many things that I did that if I, if I were to do them now, I probably wouldn't do. For instance, if I can go to a community college 
where I guess most Maryland community college, some of them are free, if I'm not mistaken, and some of them are very, very low cost. Why not go there to get as much of the credit that you need? And maybe if you still want that four-year education, yeah, you can transfer to a four-year college, but you will go in with a lot of credit. And therefore, mm. your tuition is not going to be high. You're not going to yeah. you know, pay so much for that education because you're only going in basically halfway done. So those are the type of things that, of course, you encourage folks to do. And for me, knowing what I know, if I have family now and my kids want to have certain type of degree or education, and I feel like they can attain part of it in a community college, I will encourage it. Because where I'm working, my school is not written on my forehead. Nobody cares about which school I went to. It's all about me being competent at my job, you know? So, um, of course, my 401k is one of them. Um, I have other um, investment that I'm involved in that I'm doing. You know, there's so many different types of investment. I've done my research, you know, I've talked to financial advisors. Um, I've received some recommendations on those that are, some of them, of course, are high risk. Some of them are low risk. Um, um, Sister Olivia mentioned one well, like the CD where, you know, like youngsters can put their money in type of a savings. It's very low risk. So I have different types of investment that I've put my money in. And that's because I'm thinking of my future. I'm thinking of my future husband. I'm thinking of my children because mm. the type of struggles that I went through, I don't want my children to go through, you know. I want to have a family where I'm not only financially knowledgeable, but to also to be able to pass on that to them. And yes, I want to have a comfortable life with my family, but I also want a situation where my kids will also um, be financially knowledgeable and mm. not, you know, um, only just reap off the, 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 I guess, the benefits that I have, but to also be financially sound to continue to build on the wealth that okay. I guess I am starting. So those are the type of things that I'm doing now or um, are currently in progress. All right. Okay. That man is blessed, man. I'm telling you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. So guys, <laughs> guys, we're going to open the phone, the, the lines right now for your questions. But once uh, our producer Sachs is doing that, uh, let me ask uh, 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 Mr. Cool. Let me ask you this, man. You want pressing that even when you are sleeping, your money is working for you, <laughs> right? Yes. Most people don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> but what are some of the um, things that you put your money in that, you know, for sure, it's bringing you some returns, even right now, that, you know, you, you, your money is working. You know, you put money aside and it's in a, it's in a savings account and you see, you open your savings account and the, the, the balance is so big and then you are happy <laughs> versus putting that money to work. You know, how, do you, how, how, how are you handling that? Yeah, because, um, so it's, it's said that let your, don't work for money. Let your money work for you. Um, a lot of people work for money. And when you work for money, you don't, you don't even, you, don't, you can't even save a lot. But when your money is working for you, that means you're, you're making more money. Plug that, never... book, plug that book that your, your, your uncle gave you. <laughs> and you're also not considered rich if... Um, you're, you're also not considered wealthy if your money doesn't make more money for you. Mm -hmm. So um, putting your money in just savings accounts, it doesn't grow. Mm -hmm. so you have to make sure you put it in different places. And right now... In our generation, we are so fortunate. There are so many things which you can put your money in and it will grow for you over 100%. So there are stocks, um, there's your 401k, um, there's real estate. There are a whole lot of things that you can put your money in and it's going to multiply for you more than 100%. So you can imagine if you are, you start right now at the age of, let's say, let me just say 30. Right, right, at the age of 30, you put your money in your 401k, your stocks or your um and the stocks and and the stocks and real estate is not for everyone you should know your strength and where um the, the place where you feel comfortable investing in mm -hmm. so you're doing all these things but the 401k is very very necessary your retirement account is very very necessary so you start if you start doing it right now by the age of 30 right by the time you get to 50 or even 60 there's no way you have less than a million dollar in your account you know, mm. and you don't want to be you don't want to get to your 60s or your 70s and you're still working hard whilst you should be enjoying life with your grandchildren or your kids and all of that so it's very very necessary to start now to invest 
and your 401k. That's the basic thing you can do. Your retirement account. That's the basic thing you can do. And there are a lot of things you can go into. It's very even in the Bible, real estate was something that was going on. Because in, in if if let's say they say Abraham left wealth for his, his his children, he left land for his children. So real estate is something that I would encourage everyone to go in because it's very, very key as well. Mm. And other things and there are so many books which you can read that will give you knowledge on all of these things and if you start doing that doing this thing now in the i want to I, I wanted you to plug your favorite book um so <laughs> there's this book called um money master the game um it's, uh, it's, it's it was written by tony robbins um he, he tells us how to allocate our investments mm. and, the things to invest in because sometimes a lot of people once once you're familiar with something you just put all our money in it and that is a very very wrong move if you put all your money in one um, type of investments mm -hmm. anything can happen in 2008 there was this whole real estate bubble that crashed a lot of um real estate so imagine if you put all your money in your real estate in, in real estate you and that thing happened to you you've lost everything so it's always good to diversify, di diversify, put your money in real estate, put your money in your savings account, put your money in your 401k, put your money everywhere. So while somewhere is losing, somewhere is growing. So you are making money from either side. You understand me? And, it, and one thing that also, um, another book that um, I also encourage everyone to read, every millennial to read, it's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, it gives Rich you, Dad, Poor Dad. Yes, yes, by um, Robert... Uh, Kiwasaki, I think that's his last name. I'm not too sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a good book. I also encourage everyone to read. It opens your mind in, in order for you to have financial freedom. Because okay. they're all trying to achieve that financial freedom. And okay. whatever the millionaires are doing, we can also do the same thing. Because um, I think it's, it's been proven that most of the billionaires or millionaires in this world. Um, they are all here. They are yeah. all here on Zoom right now. <laughs> They are all yeah. here on Zoom right now. So if, yeah. if you want to claim it for yourself, go ahead and claim it because God turned it upon this. Yes, yes. And we're all self-made. So I also encourage everyone that we can also get there. We don't have to have um, billionaire parents to be billionaires or millionaire parents to be millionaires. We can also start now. And if you have a million dollar in your account, you're a millionaire. So if we start doing these th things now and our money is multiplying for us, I think it's something that we should all do. Okay. All right. So um, somebody can... Real quick, to what Pamela well, said. Yeah, go ahead. Um, to the 401k. So usually the 401k, right, um, whoever the, um, I guess the investment agency is, they usually put it in a default account. So just know that you do have the control to distribute, you know, the funds. And that is also a way to accrue, you know, um, additional more money. So just okay. kind of an FYI there because... One thing that usually people do is whatever, um, I guess, funds that they are distributing, it just sits in there. But you can actually, you can talk to a financial advisor and you can distribute the funds to different investment accounts where it can also earn you more money. Amen. Thank you for that. Now, speaking about for please, can somebody get to my producer, Sachs, to unmute so we can go to question time, please, because I can't hear him. Sachs, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. There. Okay, so talking about 401k, before we, we start our questioning, I think one mistake that young people are doing, you start a job, you're making good money, and your company offers 401k, and they are asking that, that you ask what is the maximum, they say some are mostly 10 to 15%. Why don't you take the maximum, mm -hmm. especially when the company is matching it? So this is, this is what it means. If you are telling the company, take 100, say I'm maxing it like 15%, and you say every month or every two weeks, my maximum I want to do the 15% comes to 500, and the company is matching it. When they put that 500 in that investment account, the company pays another 500 for you. Mm -hmm. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is the more reason why you should max it whenever they give you your 401k, there are people who have a max of 15% and they are doing 1%. <laughs> and they don't realize they're cheating wow. themselves because they want their money to spend it now. We can't be doing that, okay? So I think the lines 
are open right now. If anybody yeah, has Pastor, a question. Pastor Dodo, I think somebody yeah. sent a question to the chat. So I, I, Let me add to what Pastor Dodo said. Um, okay. Maybe you are worried about contributing 10% or 15% at a particular time. But also remember that you can always lower it. Maybe you would later in life, you have kids mm -hmm. and you have to pay day child care or you have more financial obligations. You can always change it back to 5% when you have more um, financial obligations. Yeah. At the moment where you have a lot of disposable um, income, you can always do, do the maximum and yeah. get matched. And my yeah, so always remember that you can always lower it when you have more financial obligations as you go along. Okay. All right, so Sax, we're ready. Okay, so the first question is, I am a prom proponent of real estate investing in the U.S., but what is the investment benefit, ROI, return on investment, of buying or building property back home in Ghana when you live here in the States? That's the question. Okay, who wants to take it? Okay, I, I will take that. I, I, I believe that you can never go wrong with real estate investment. And um, even though you are not living in Ghana, you can actually buy a land or you know, buy a home where you can rent. You can rent and Remember, it accrues, equity accrues, yeah. um, you know, equity accrues. And I can give you an example of my sister. My sister came to London when she was very young, you know, many, many years ago. And my father, you know, advised her to buy a land and build. And she bought the land for, she bought it for like 400 pounds at the time. It was in the 80s. She bought it for 400 pounds. And recently, you know, she sold the land because she couldn't really build on it. She's still in Canada with her family. She's not going back. And she sold the land. And you know how much money she got? She got about $80,000 on it, just the land. Now, now you, you're going to make everybody go after her. <laughs> you know, she just invested 400 uh, pounds at the time. Yeah. And when she sold it, she got $80,000, you know? Wow. So, I mean, you can never go wrong with real estate yeah. anyway. Yes. The only downside in Ghana, or there are some risks involved, you have to have, you know, somebody who is taking care of your property for you if you are lending it. You have to make sure that they are in good hands because I, I know that Sometimes people will steal your land or, you know, mess up your home or even try to kill you to take the land. So those are the downsides. But I believe that you never go wrong with real estate, be it in Ghana or here. You might not be living there, but you can rent it and equity will build for you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What's the next question? There's no question. And I think okay. that was the only question. Can you can you unmute them? Because if somebody's on, on and they want to ask a question so they can. Yeah, if if anyone has a question, they can raise their hand and I'll unmute, unmute them. So. Okay, Deidre. Deidre raise her hand. Yeah, you can you can unmute yourself too. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Deidre. So hey, how everyone. are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm doing well. Go ahead. That's great. Okay, so my question is, um, I think it's towards Frida and maybe Krabna. Um, but Frida mentioned like she was making money or something along that line passively. And um, I know for myself, like um, I got into medical school, praise God, and I'll be going to medical school. But unfortunately, the medical school is not in Maryland. And so I know I can't live with my parents. Um, and even with that, my mom will be going to Ghana when she retires, which is very soon. Um, so I guess my question is like knowing that I would have to pay rent and I have to do these things. Um, I was trying to figure out what are some ways that I can still um, like invest in my future financially, even as I'm still going to be in school and like I have no choice but to pay rent. And I was thinking of probably using my degree um, to also become a teacher in whatever state I will be in for medical school. 
Um, but I know like I also want ways to passively earn money other than investing. So what would you guys recommend? And my last question was, um, would you recommend I, I like hire an actual financial advisor or just yeah. a lot, you know, yeah. things like this? Cause mm-hmm. I want to be able to do this even at my young age, like you guys said before, I don't want to wait until I graduate medical school to now, you know, start building towards my future. So that's my question. Okay, so Frida, before you go on with the last part, so why you know we have those resources? So that one, don't even worry about that, hiring a financial advisor. We got you on that. Okay, Frida, go ahead. Awesome. So um, there are so many ways that you can passively um, make income. So now we know YouTube. That's one example. And I'll give you multiple examples. YouTube is a resource that when basically it's like the Google for, for, <laughs> for videos. You know, and this is the place where if you have any interest or if you have any passion or hobby, you can literally leverage that to make money for you. And the good thing about YouTube is you can make a video today and it will still be making money for for you like two years to come or three years to come. You know, you don't have to continuously make the same video. Of course, you have to make different types of video. So it's one of those things that at times it can take a while to build your audience, but with these type of things that we are talking about, it's not going to happen overnight. You know, you, it, it's going to take time. Some of these things will take time for it to happen. So YouTube is one resource that you can use. If you have any interest, like you mentioned tutoring. So if there's any subject that you're interested in or you are very good at, you can make YouTube videos. You don't even have to show your face. You know, some people are very camera shy. You don't have to show your face. You can actually teach that particular subject, make videos about it. You don't need any fancy camera. You can record from your phone. So far as you have an internet, that's all you need. You can record from your phone, post it on YouTube. Trust me, you will find an audience. It might take some time for you to, you know, build a large audience, but that shouldn't really be the focus. Just keep making it, keep doing it. And eventually you will find a bunch of people that will really gravitate your videos. And years to come, anytime you get views, that video is going to make you money. You know, so that is one thing. Um, initially, when we were speaking, um, so Olivia mentioned um, the CDs. You know, that's a type of savings account where, of course, it has interest on it. So if you have work now, if you're working now, instead of just putting your money in a regular savings account, you can put it into a CD. And that could be passively making, you know, earnings for you without you really doing much about it. There are different types of mutual funds, you know, even money market savings you know, where you put your money in those type of savings accounts and it accrues interest, you know, on them. So that is passively really not doing anything. You may not really have a side gig where like, for instance, the tutoring where you're tutoring somebody every weekend, but those are the type of things that will be making money. Ebooks. Some people love to read. Um, some people love to write. There's a market there. You can create ebooks about literally everything and anything. Mm-hmm. Etsy, you can sell your ebooks on Etsy. I've bought like, I remember when I get into my fitness thing, I bought um, a book on um, Etsy for how to cook healthy meals under 30 minutes or 10 minutes, you know? So there's so many different resources and, and I can connect with you offline and, you know, give you some of these resources. There's so many resources out there where you can create a bunch of eBooks. It doesn't even have to be a lot. It can be how to do something and it can be just a one page of PDF. You post it on there. And people could be buying it. It's just one item that you've created. It's on the digital market. And guess what? Anytime somebody downloads it, maybe you charge $10, $20, whatever it is. You are making money in your sleep without even thinking about it. You know? Yeah. So yeah. those are the type of things that we can do. And a lot of us, especially millennials, we have a lot of passion. Some of us have interest in so many things. And it's going to waste. We are not using it. We are not really leveraging the passion, the interest, the, the, the hobbies that we have. You know, and and it's it's going to waste. And I feel like those are the type of resources that you can utilize to make money passively. Aside from you know the investment like the stock market, ETFs, mutual funds, which you know tend to be a bit more tricky with somebody who may not be necessarily financially um, knowledgeable, but it can be done as well. You know, if you if you have a good financial advisor, somebody who really understands money, they can direct you to invest in those type of things. You know like a dividend stocks, like so many different types of like markets out there that you can put your, um, your money in. And those can be also be making money for you um, passively. 
Even your 401k, that's also an, another example. So um, I guess those are the, the type of immediate example I can think of. But like I said, if you want to talk more, I can connect with you offline. And I'll be able to give you, you know, more um, specific, different types of examples that you can um, mm -hmm. maybe research on and see which one fits your niche. And hopefully, okay. You'll be able to do All right, that. hey, hey, uh, Sachs, it's Pasta on. Um, yes, he he's with Ajua. Can you unmask him, please? Because <laughs> unmask, that, unmask that young man, please unmask <laughs> him. We want to see him because some of the questions. We'll go to him. So, anybody has another question? Pastor George, I had a little, I'm sorry, Pastor Ines, I had a little contribution to this. In sure. Case, maybe there's a, a guy there who has this in mind. Um, mm -hmm. that you can also do, which I haven't thought about. If you want quick money, instant money as a student, if you have a relatively old car, you can get the older app. Enjoying the day. You are your own boss. You don't have class. You can do it until you can get back. Time ago, when Uber came first, I experimented with it. I just wanted to see how it was. And you know, I have a relaxed When I go from work around two o'clock, sometimes I put on my app. That one I had an app which I used. Well, maybe you can. Oh my God, I was making a lot of money, which I used. I wasn't even spending my income again. I was just using that Uber money for our little outings, sending money home. But uh, I mean, I sold that car, I no longer do it. But for a student, it's something that you can definitely look into. But do it during the day and stuff like that. And it's not risky. Okay. 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 Um, do we have any questions? Um, it's past, I saw Pastor George. Yeah, he's coming on. Oh, okay. Hello, Mrs. Harlow. Hi. <laughs> so whilst we're waiting for questions, um, Kabla, yes, sir. Don't don't go to sleep on me, man. <laughs> you don't. Now let let me ask you this. Um, oh, Pastor George is here. Yes. Pastor George. Yes. How you doing, sir? Very well. Good. I see you're rocking our t-shirt. Yeah, it looks good on you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question. Are you supposed? Um, my producer needs to get me these questions. So, Pastor George, um, since we have you, oh, Auntie Julia, good to see you. Yeah, oh, Ellie, I didn't call your name, <laughs> Pastor George. Yes. Uh, you've been listening. Uh, do you have something you want to add to this whilst we are waiting for our question? Well, it's very good. I, I think that uh, a lot of very good information. I got <laughs> <laughs> that boy is something else. <laughs> he wants to share his viewpoint. I know. I, I think it's, it's, it's for people to listen very carefully to what is being said and do their Pastor, if you can get closer to the microphone, we can hear you. Yeah. Please. Thanks. I'm saying, now can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we can. I'm saying the key is, is for everything you do, you have to learn. You know, if you don't learn, you will know. If you don't ask questions and you don't do your research, you will know. And for some of these, uh, your panel is really... I remember when I met them and I started to do most of these things, they didn't know anything, but I saw them, I saw the determination and the desire to learn. And that's what got them to where they are. Um, so that, that's basically what I'm going to say. And one thing I want to say also to motivate those listening is this. This information you are getting is not for you only. It's a generational information. This is not going to change your life, but you change the life of your children too. When you go to the book of Proverbs, it says that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Not his children, yeah. but his children's children. Because when you learn these things, your children will learn from you. They will learn to invest. They will learn to save. Okay? Right. So, they will also be wealthy, so they won't need your money. That's why you can pass it on to your grandchildren. And for many of us, because our parents didn't know these things, we were caught in a trap of poverty. You know, not because God didn't love us, not because the opportunities mm -hmm. were in there, but we're simply ignorant. Mm -hmm. We compare it to mm -hmm. our white friends. Because their parents knew these things, they taught them. But my wife and I did a seminar somewhere, and somebody shared something about student loans. Is that when they came out of pharmacy school, 
they all have hundreds of thousands in student loans. And one white friend told him that he was going to live at home with his parents. And within the first two years, he would pay off all his loans. And she thought that the guy was crazy. And I said, didn't you see that he was right? Because he yeah. understood. So this information you are learning here, you know, what Frida is dropping, Kwabena and all, it's very, very valuable things. And we need to make decisions about these things. And when, one day you teach them to your children and you will find that, that that poverty thing is going to be broken. You know, that's, that, so this, this is very, very valuable information. And I'm hoping that uh, you will take it serious, do research and, and ask because as I think Pastor Eric said it, that uh, making a high income, or I think Frida, yeah. that making a high income doesn't mean anything if you can't retain it because income is not wealth. So it's not about getting a job, that yeah. person, it's more about knowing how to retain the money. Yeah, that's all I want to say, man. Okay. So, Pastor, we'll get back to you because there was a question that somebody texted me on insurance. And since uh, you were in that area of, uh, we'll come back, I'll come back and ask you that question on insurance. How important life insurance is for millennials? Okay, you still you come back to ask me, right? Yes, um, uh, I think Afi had a question. Uh, Saz, can you can you go ahead with Afi's question? Um, Deidre's question was it answered? Yeah, Deidre's question. I which think one? Had another question. Yeah, another yeah, question. Yeah, there was another. another question. Question. Can we ask? Hope? Can we ask Afi's question? Then we come back to Deidre. So when you give Sewa this platform, she will ask questions about two hundred. So let's ask. Afi's question, please. <laughs> okay. So, um, Afi's question is, to the entrepreneurs on the panel, what are some challenges you have faced and how did you overcome them? Kwabra, you want to start? Um, so, <laughs> I, have, I, don't, I haven't um, gone deep into my personal business so I haven't encountered struggles yet, but I know there are a lot of struggles that I'm going to encounter. Um, so I can't, I, I don't think I'll be the best person to um, answer that question. But there's this book that I'm reading. It's, it's called The 10X Rule. Um, it's for um, entrepreneurs. So I'll, I'll suggest that if you can read that book, it will help you a lot because it, it talks about you doing things extra in the beginning, um, doing things 10 times extra, and you're going to, after a while, you're going to reap everything you 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 um you put in. So I'm not the best person to answer that question, but that's the book I'll suggest. The ten X. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Olivia, can you pick it up, please? Since since you have a online business, you know. <laughs> well, mine is on a small scale, but you know, as as an entrepreneur, you know. When you start off, you, you, you doubt yourself. You have that self-doubt. If people are going to accept your product, are people going to, you know, buy into what you are selling? And um, I've had instances. I remember why there was a time when my brother and I started an online business on Amazon. And it was very challenging because there, were a lot of comp there was a lot of competition out there. Um, now, what, what did we have to do, you know, to, to overcome this competition? But then I'll bring my, my Etsy as an example. You know, there's a lot of competition out there. There are a lot of people selling, you know, African clothes. Now, how did I overcome these challenges? Um, I decided to uh, uh, give out exceptional customer service. So as an online business, sometimes somebody will you know, ask you a question. And, and I, I love your models. I love your models. <laughs> Those who be modeling your stuff, I love them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of competition out there as an entrepreneur, but then you have to strive every day to, to, to be, go beyond the competition. Now, how did I do that? I try to give excellent customer service. So let's say when somebody... Um, ask me a question online. I'm always, you know, very responsive. And by doing that, I'm putting myself up ahead of the other competition. Another um, challenge I've had to face is balance. I am a wife, I have children, I have a job. And sometimes it's very difficult, you know, to 
balance all of it. You know, having a small business, having a family, having a job. It, it's very challenging. But what I've done to overcome these challenges is, you know, involving my entire family. You know, I have my husband, you know, he, he works from home. So I have him, you know, delivering my stuff to the post office. I have my mm. children, yeah, delivering <laughs> to the post office. I have my children modeling for me so that I don't have to pay anybody else to, um, you know, model for me. So by so doing, I am cutting down costs, but I'm actually also paying them. And by doing so, I'm also teaching them work ethics. As yeah. well as they are, I'm teaching them work ethics. I'm teaching them to know that um, it's always very good and advantageous to have multiple streams of income. Yeah. And, um, so I've, I've, and I've also tried to always, you know, put down my goals for the day. So by having my goals for the day, I'm kind of devoting time to my family. I'm working within time, um, you know, taking care of my business. So yeah, basically these are some of the challenges trying to, you know, um, be ahead of the competition, um, trying to have balance, you know, have balance, managing my time between my family and my business. And these are some of the ways I've worked very hard, you know, to overcome some of the challenges involving my family and also working very hard to have a balance. Okay, uh, Sachs, can we have Sarah's second question, please? Okay, so she says, are you supposed to save as you pay off your loans or do you pay off and start to save? That's the question. Can you repeat the question again, please? Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, are you supposed to save as you pay off your loans or do you pay it off and then start to save? Okay, so Frida, you want to pick that up? Sure. Um, so personally, what I did was, of course, my employer was offering the 401k. So at the time, I used the 401k as my type of saving because that was free money that I was getting. Um, in terms of my personal savings, initially, I wasn't really putting much. Of course, I tried to save the emergency, the three months emergency funds. What I did was I aggressively, the goal was to pay off the loan. So I treated my 401k as a type of saving. That was my saving. And then I tackled the loan. Now I tried to max out the minimum payment that I had to pay, of course. And whatever was left, I of course paid myself and then contributed very little amount into the savings account. So I would say just trying to find the balance, you know, um, I would encourage because, because the thing is, especially if you live with your parents, then definitely pay off the loan. That should be a priority. Pay off that loan and then think of the savings later. If you live with your parents, where you know you don't have much responsibilities of paying rent or, you know, your car note or whatever the case may be, tackle the loan and then mm -hmm. save. Um, or you can actually do it simultaneously. You don't have to do one after the other. You can still do it simultaneously. It all depends on how you distribute the funds. Where you aggressively pay towards the loan, and then you save as little as you can. You know, you put it aside um, towards, I guess, your savings funds. So that's what I would advise you do. I hope that okay. answers the question. All right. Thank you, Frida. So before our next question comes, Pastor, um, will it be possible for you to address um, the importance of life insurance uh, to millennials. You're muted. See? You always say, I'm technologically challenged. <laughs> no, for me, it's a luxury. Uh, <laughs> the essence of insurance is, is for the protection of your family. Um, like we said about you can lose your job at any time, you can also uh, pass away at any time. So if you really care for your family, you care for your children, you don't want the standard of living to drop drastically, that is the essence of life insurance. So when you are starting a family, you are young, yes, do it. Um, you should. 
you decide to get married, have children, you need to have life insurance. So if something happens to you, your children can, can uh, have, you know, their in, in emergencies taken care of. Uh, if you are single, um, you can take a little insurance just in case something happens to you so your dad and mom will not cry too much, at least. Uh, but the need is not that critical. But when you decide to start a family, I think it's very important that you do. Yeah. Um, one time, like many years ago, we were having a, a, um, a seminar on these things in a church, and somebody said, I have life assurance in Christ. Why do, why do I need life insurance? <laughs> it, it's, people just don't understand this. Insurance, whether it's car, it's... it's, it's uh, health or whatever. What is happening is that in life there are certain risks, okay. And when you buy insurance, you, you, you buy the insurance. You are pulling your risk, you know, so that if something happens, I buy a car. I trust God that God will help me to drive safely. But if I hit somebody, you know, that is why I get the insurance. If my car gets stolen, that is why I have the insurance. If yeah. I have to die when I have major financial responsibility. So my wife and my kids don't have to be thrown out of my house. That is why I buy life insurance. So they can continue to live comfortably. So, so I, I advise people, I personally, personally, there are many types of life insurance. There's whole life, there's universal life, there is uh, what they call term life. I personally like term life, term life more because term life, you are paying for the insurance only, purely insurance, and it's cheap. So many people can afford it. When you go to the top side, which is the whole life, it is more expensive, but it is insurance that is tied into an investment. So you pay every month, part of it goes towards pure insurance, and the balance goes towards an investment, which also grows with it. The investor life is in the middle somewhere. Investor life, the investment is more flexible, and people think it is cheaper. So these are the, the various types of insurances that they are. But I would advise anybody, if you're starting a family, please get some life insurance. Mm. Um, Thank Pastor, you, sir. Um, Pastor Ernest, I want to add a little bit to what Pastor said. Um, Go sure. Yeah. Um, and this is to the women especially. Uh, many a time when you marry, you think that because uh, there's this uh, perspective that men die early. Um, <laughs> the men take life insurance and put you on, forgetting that sometimes women can also Does. die. Yes, don't, yeah, start so a, don't start a civil war. <laughs> <laughs> so please, um, women too should. I mean, it should. Both, both spouses should take life insurance and put uh, each, each other. other on as beneficiaries. It will help a lot. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Sachs, uh, I thought I saw a question by some Regi Miss Regina or something. Um, it wasn't a question. I think it was a contribution. She says, oh. with regards to the challenges encountered by entrepreneurs, my little contribution from my experience is that there's an opportunity in every challenge we encounter. We need to look out for that. Also, I encourage the entrepreneurs to read Never Waste a Good Crisis. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate that. You have a, you have a question? Um, no. No, okay, no. so so on a program note, in three weeks, God willing, we're tackling another subject, self-esteem, confidence, okay? And you'll be surprised who we have coming on. You'll be surprised. So we're going to post that shortly. Um, do we have any more questions? Somebody has a question. Kwabra, you have a question. Yes, I have a question. And you, this are, is, you on the panda, you have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question to uh, um, Pastor and Mrs. Gavoa. Uh, so um, how do you work on your finances together? Because I know a lot of people, especially like younger people, don't know. Some people believe in, um, don't know how to work on finances. Some people are like, who takes care of this bill? Who does this? Who does this? So what's your take on that? Um, I want to start this, and Olivia will come in. The reason I want to start is that I don't do anything finance. I left everything to Olivia. She balances the books. She's always dragging me, Eric, let's do a budget. Uh, and let's do a budget. Let's do a budget and stuff like that. So I'll have an answer. I only go by what she says. That's, that, <laughs> that's what I do. So I'll have an answer. Yeah. So, um, Smart what, man. <laughs> with us, um, I am more like the the saving type. I believe that 
with every couple, there is one spender and then one, you know, the one who likes to save. I'm the saver, I'm more financially. So I'm the one who handles the finances. But then um, he also knows what is going on. Like we have a budget. We have a budget saved on Excel where we all know what bills we are supposed to pay for this, what bills we are supposed to pay for this. So even though I manage all the finances, I pay all the bills, I make sure that there is money in the account and all that. He also knows what bills are supposed to be paid. If, we, if there's no money, I inform him if there's money, you know. So, and basically what we do is every um, like three months, we'll sit down together, go over our budget, We'll see, you know, where um, we are doing well, where we have to improve, you know, um, we, 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 where we have to cut down, where we, so we, we, we sit down, we put our money together. And it's very important that as a couple, you put your money together because the Bible says that um, the two shall become one. When you marry, you become one. So we believe that it is very important that you put your money together as a couple. You know, there, there, there shouldn't be any, you know, separate accounts as a couple because once you come together, you are one. And um, because I, I feel like, um, you know, if you have decided to have kids, share kids, then you should be able to share your finances, you know. So it's very important that you put your money together as a couple you are one once you decided to come together and you are a financial, powerful financial house when you put your money together as a couple. So put mm. your money together, have financial goals together. Um, you know, decide what bills you have to pay down, how you are saving, you know, work on the budget together. Always have a budget that every now and then you go back and look on and see where you are doing well, where you need to improve and all that. And let me say that we also take care of our parents, but we take off our parents according to their needs. Olivia's um, dad is no longer around. He passed and it's only the mom who is alive. So we want to make sure that we take care of her. I have my dad and my mom alive and um, they are a little bit financially stable. So even though we send them money, we don't send them money as much as we send to Olivia's mother. We make sure that every month Olivia's mother is catered for. And it's something oh. we do. So when that money is going out, there's no struggle about it at all. We know that we have to do that. And also, yeah. sometimes I am in the office and Olivia will just text me, please don't use their card, don't spend money. We don't have money. so. Please don't spend any money till so so and so, and then we we'll start spending again. So we have that understanding. I don't so the communication has to be really going on. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not mad at all. I don't use the card. I don't yeah. use money until she gives me the go hard. <laughs> you can now. <laughs> and then I and I'm going to my spending too. I'll let you know. And it's also very important to be transparent. You know, you have to be very transparent with your finances. You shouldn't be hiding any money anywhere that your spouse doesn't know about. And even before you get into marriage, if you have any debt or, you know, you have to disclose all of it. Transparency yeah. is very, very, very important. Don't hide any, amount, uh, you know, mountain of debt from your spouse before you enter into the marriage. And then after you get married, your, your, your spouse gets to find out that, oh, you had all this debt and you hid it from me. Likewise, don't hide any savings. Some of us have, you know, multiple accounts and different banks and, you know, disclose all of it, you know, because once you decide to come together, you are one. Everything becomes one. There is nothing like a separate account here, a separate account here. You are one. You've decided to share kids you should be able to share your finances together. And you should always have a financial goal, which you go by. Yeah. Okay. One more okay. thing. Okay, sorry. One more thing I was going uh -huh. to say. That be very modest in your spending to, together. Um, there's no point um, spending a lot on expensive clothes if you can get those clothes at a discounted price somewhere. So please... Uh, Modest. I mean, that will also keep the budget intact for you to use to do other things. Hey, Pastor Eric, you are claiming your point, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so um, one question that I know uh, we'll come back to you. I think there's a question from Vicentia, but let me ask this. One question that millennials are faced with, it's not a question, but it's a reality that they are faced with, credit card debts, okay? Um, uh, Frida, don't, don't write a thesis on this one. <laughs> how, how, how should millennials handle credit card debts? So, um, I guess, fortunately and unfortunately, we live in a society where you need a credit score or some sort of, you know, credit to get a lot of things done, even buying a house. Of course, you don't need to have a perfect credit score. But even if you're going to get a credit card at some point, you need to really understand what you're getting yourself into, um, first of all. Um, because sometimes people have that ideology that if I have the credit card, you know, this is free money to spend. No, it's not free money. It's money that you owe. And also there are conditions to the credit card spending. The condition is you can only utilize less than 30% of the amounts that you've been given. So um, basically, the amount that you spend on the credit card and the limits that they've given you, you have to make sure that the amount that you owe, it's not going to be more than 30% of the, of, the, of the credit limit. I guess the to So for instance, if you have a credit card that has a total of $1,000 on it, you cannot spend more than $300. You know, and that, sometimes that is the thing a lot of people get confused. They feel like, okay, I have this $1,000, I can spend whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And they spend just crazily on it and... Yes, you can spend it, but also have, you have to understand that it has interest on it. And not only that, it's going to affect your credit because your utilization is going to be really high. Yes, the essence of the, you having the card is to build your credit, but you are basically doing more damage to it than actually building the credit. So in having a credit card, and now there's so many different types of card that comes with rewards, you know, um, you can get a card that, of course, even though I don't encourage it, to be quite honest with you, I personally don't have any credit card debt. I don't encourage it, but even if you're going to have that, have one card that you don't really use a lot on it. You don't just go out it. there and just spend just, you know, crazily. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you are not, um, like I said, with the, um, less than 30%, you're not spending more on the card than you've been issued. And also keep in mind, yes, yeah, some of these credit cards, you know, they will tell you, okay, the minimum payment for this month is $30. But what uh -huh. you don't understand is the rate, the interest rate is not on that $30. So some people yeah. think, oh, if I pay $35, I'm good. I'm building my credit. Or if I pay $35, I'm avoiding interest. No. The interest is on the balance, the total balance of the card. So if you use $500 on this $1,000 card, and the minimum payment is $30. You have to understand that the interest is not on the $30, it's on the $500, yeah. which of course is high. And not only that, it doesn't really help you because your utilization is really high. So personally, I don't encourage that, but I know that there are gonna be circumstances where you will need a credit card. You don't need too many credit cards. It's really not smart. It's not a really good you know, mentality to have to just um, rely too much on credit cards. But even if you're gonna have one, have those ones with rewards, you know, um, hopefully with, with less interest and really watch out for the spending. Don't spend too much on it. And of course, pay on time, you know, pay on time. Um, because different credit cards have or different credit card companies have based when they report, you know, you're spending to the credit report companies, which of mm. course is where your credit score is going to come in. So, just make sure you're very knowledgeable on these things. You're doing your research, you're reading on these things, you know exactly what the conditions are and um, do what, what basically will help you financially and not just be blind about all this just because you have the money at your disposal. You're just completely blind and just going out there and just spending. No, yeah. it, it's not gonna happen. We need to be prudent about that. Exactly. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, can we? Can we take uh, Vicentia, probably that would be our last question, and then our senior pastor will, will give us some closing remarks. Uh, can you give us um, Vicentia's question, please? Um, so Vicentia's question is, how can those in college, or maybe just getting out of college, start to build their credit score? Okay, Olivia, you want to pick it up? Yeah. Um, they can... Um, have their parents, you know, apply for a credit card where 
they are on the credit card with them. You know, the parent can co-sign a credit card with them and then, you know, take about $500, start off with $500, you know. Um, once you start making payments regularly, once you start, you know, um, paying on time, the financial institution can increase it for you. And I'll advise that um, try as much as possible to go through the credit unions. Credit unions are very good places to start off. I started off with a, a credit union. Um, they have, you know, so many benefits that the regular banks don't offer. So you can start off with that. But, um, you know, take a little bit. Your parent can even uh, get you a debit card through your bank, you know, start off with that. And gradually, once you build on it, start with your parents to co-sign on a credit card, you build on that, you make payments, make sure you are paying on time, make sure you are paying regularly, make sure you are not um, max, um, maxing out the credit card. And once you start doing that, you'll be building your credit. Then you go ahead and you know apply for another credit card. And once the other bank institution has seen your you know, credit history with on-time payment, low budget on the credit card, they are likely, approve, uh, likely to approve you for another credit card. So that's how I, I believe you can start off. Okay. Uh, one thing, uh, uh, Klaus, I'll come to you. One thing I want to let uh, young people understand, when you talked about the, the check me when you talked about co-signing, whatever you do, please, I don't care what lines that man or that lady gives you. Whatever you do, never, ever co-sign for a friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, I don't care how much you love that person. Never co-sign for a friend. You know why? Because that card that you are co-signing or that loan that you are co-signing, what they are telling you is this. Your friend came for the loan. He doesn't qualify. Or we don't think he can pay us back that loan. So you co-signing means that you are the one who is going to own that loan. So please, 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 whatever you do, never ever co-sign for anybody unless you are married. Quabs, go ahead. Yeah, um, there's something also called um, secure credit card. And with that one, it's your own money that you're putting in. So as you mean, um, you go to a credit union or a financial um, institution, right? and you tell them you are looking for a secure credit card. So that one is your personal money. You know, maybe you are putting $500 in, so you take money out of your account or your, 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 your bank, um, mm -hmm. $500, and you put it on that secure credit card. And you pay yourself. So as, at any time you spend it, you pay on time and all, all of that. It also builds your credit history. So that's one thing that I advise a lot of people who come out of college, so that you have debt. Because the secure credit cards, it prevents all debts aside up because it's your own money, it's your personal money. So that one helps a lot, better than going for um, the credit card sometimes. And that one also helps you to be disciplined because at the end of the day, you are, you are going with your own personal money. So if you are disciplined with that, you can be okay with the um, credit card. But if you're not disciplined with that, then just don't go for the credit card now. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, Quabs, um um, Sachs, we don't have any more questions. I'm going to ask Pastor to um, just run it up for us. Please. He was making dad jokes on mute, guys. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me say this about the, the credit. Um, and they tried to clarify what Kavanaugh said. What happens is that if, for example, in your bank or credit union, you have a savings account for $1,000 in it, you tell them to give you a credit card against that account, which has a limit of $500. So in essence, you cannot draw your account down to less than $500. So it's secure. So they are holding your $500 and giving you a credit card with a limit of $500. So after a while, after about a year, you pay consistently, then they tell you that, okay, now the credit card is no more secure. We are giving you a true credit card. And that is one good way to build your credit, okay? Um, 
So if you don't have a parent to co-sign for you, that's a good way to build it. Um, that, that's what I have to say. I think the information that has been shared has been very solid, very good. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the panelists. Thank you very much, panelists. You've done a good job. So no question about it. Uh, but for those of you listening, um, take the information very, very seriously. Um, Pastor Eric did mention the idea of keeping your accounts together. Um, it's something that many people have a difficulty doing. As soon as there's one argument, they pull their money out. I don't understand it. Studies have shown, even Fidelity Investments did a, a, a survey of, of, of those with accounts with them over 100,000 balance, and they told them to give advice to newly married couples. One of the things they said, make all financial decisions together. So it doesn't make sense. And, and, and I, it's something I, I tell people all the time, but they just think it's abnormal that you should keep your money together. I don't know what, what's the problem with that if you are married, unless you are thinking that maybe you are going to work out for the marriage one day and your money is more important to you than the marriage, you know. But this thing is to, to, to build wealth, uh, it takes discipline. Discipline is key. Um, and it's something that, when people come to me sometimes to talk about helping them with finances, as much as I try to give them all this advice, the key thing is we need to do the spirit of covetousness. So if you can't control your spending, deal with the spirit of covetousness because that is what who says it's trouble. Jesus said, uh, we should wear of covetousness. And a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he owns. The shoes you have, the cars you have, those don't, things that appreciate, that is not what defines your life. And a lot of time when you are young and you overspend, Warren Buffett said that if you spend money on what you don't need, one day you are going to sell what you need, you know, because it, it puts you in a mess. Mm -hmm. um, at our age now, we can say the sacrifices that you make when you are young allows you to live better when you are old. So everything you do now is an investment into your future, into your children's future also, so that you break the cycle of poverty and your children to begin to live well. In my final year in, in, in grad school, business school, I did some research on cosmetics. And what I found out really, really, really made me sad. Poor people spend more on cosmetics than rich people do. The rich people go to the dollar store and buy any color and put it on. I mean, the poor people buy all the designer, I didn't even know they were designer cosmetics, and put it on their face in the evening, they wipe it off, and they think they look good. You know, so we need to watch, break our habits. Frida said it, she had to change, make a lot of changes in her life. We make changes, God will bless it, and we'll be wealthy. If God gives you, and you keep using it, you know, you keep overusing it. I think Bernard made an important thing about what God taught Joseph. You know, in the hard time, during the, during the abundance time, save, yeah. so that you use it during the, the, the period of famine. Of, it's a principle of life. God did not tell Joseph to rebuild and buy the famine. You know, COVID-19 came, and I was telling one group last time that what we did before COVID-19 came would determine how this thing will affect us. If you save, you invest, when this thing comes, it's a breeze. But if you were living, you know, lavishly, and it hits you, then you are in trouble. You know, and this is going, another one will come. I guarantee you. But how we, what we do today will determine what happens when that one comes. So I want to encourage you young people, let's start early. I uh, think Kwabna said it, if you start investing early, you can make a million dollars very, very easily and, and have a very good life, you know, and leave an inheritance for your children's children also. Uh, th those are the remarks I want to add to close. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Um, guys, man, thank you so much. You, you see why I feel comfortable around you because I can talk to you, people can talk to you, and Frida, kudos. That, that, that guy is, is lucky. He better come quick. Kwabra? Yes, Uncle. Thank you, sir. Welcome. And the song, please, 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 I will follow you. Go check it out. Yes. And Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Pastor and Mrs. Gavoa, mm -hmm. thank you so much. We appreciate all that you do for us. So, God willing, June 27 is the big time. It's going down. That is self-esteem, confidence. 
So watch out for the panelists. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. All right? Good night, everybody.